Looks like people are still joining, but I'm going to go ahead and get started because we have a nice full program today. I'm Christy Sullivan. I'm the secretary of ASCCT. Um, that's the American Society for Cellular and Computational Toxicology. Welcome to our May webinar. This is also presented uh, together with the European Society for Toxicology in vitro. I would like to encourage you to visit our websites to learn more about our organizations and consider becoming a member to support our programs like annual meetings and this webinar series. The webinar is recorded and the recording will be posted on the ASCCT website a few days from now. In the webinar platform, you can ask questions of the presenters using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the uh, screen. You have a toolbar and so please put your questions there there will be a Q&A after each speaker, so I encourage you to add your questions while the speaker is speaking. We are also using closed captioning subtitles. If you want to enable or hide them, you can do so at the bottom of your toolbar where you see live transcript. And then finally, I'd encourage you to say hello in the chat and let us know where you're joining from. So just a quick note about some upcoming events. First of all, the ESTIF Congress is happening in November of this year in Barcelona. And um, I'd encourage you all to register. There's a really nice program on offer. We are also um, moving ahead with planning for the 11th annual ASCCT meeting. That's gonna be in Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. Abstract submission is open. Anyone who would like to present on science or policy related to the session themes, but also other areas related to in vitro and computational toxicology, please feel free to submit your abstracts. And I want to encourage you to sign up for a special webinar. We're collaborating with ESTIF to hold next week. It's a webinar that is a benefit for um, the people of Ukraine the collected registration fees, there's a small registration fee, will be used to support Ukraine via the organization People in Need. And the webinar will be a policy and science discussion, um, talking about the impact of science on policymakers and the impact of policies on science, in particular on NAM's implementation and development. The speakers you can see on the screen, Francois Bousquet from Alter Talks, myself, and Natalia Bubalo from the National University of Food Technologies in the Ukraine. Uh, so I just want to encourage you to sign up and join us for that webinar. If you can't attend, you can consider registering and receive the link to the recording anyway. So on to today's program. Uh, our first speaker is Anouk Thienpont. Anouk earned her master's degree in pharmaceutical sciences in 2019 and is currently pursuing a PhD in in vitro toxicology and dermatocosmetology department at the Vrije University Brussels in Belgium in collaboration with Cienzano. Her PhD project focuses on next generation risk assessment to assess the genotoxicity of chemical compounds without the use of experimental animals. And specifically, GenoMark, a transcriptomics-based biomarker consisting of 84 genes that identify genotoxicants based on gene expression changes in human HEPA-RG cells. Anouk is also the winner of the Ray Tice Tox 21 Student Award in 2021, the ASCCT awards that um, recognition for the best student presentation during our annual meeting. And that um, award was funded uh, by Dr. Ray Tice. It's an award series we provide every year for um, making progress in toxicity testing in the 21st century. Our second speaker is Dr. Silvia Scaglioni. Dr. Scaglioni earned her PhD in biomedical engineering in 2005. She's authored over 100 scientific papers, holds seven patents, and in 2019, she won the IT Win Best Inventor Award. She's worked as a senior researcher at the National Research Council of the Institute of Electronics, Information, Engineering, and Telecommunications since 2010, and chief scientist of REACT for Life since 2017. 
She also serves as a project coordinator with FET Open Horizon 2020 on in vitro cancer models for accelerating disease modeling and testing novel ther therapies. And her work as European Innovation Council Ambassador centers on bringing research results to the market. I'm really looking forward to both of these presentations. And so um, with that, I will uh, give the floor to Anouk. Thank you, Christy, for this nice introduction. And uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I would like to present you my research about the development of a new prediction model for genotoxicity. And why do we need new in vitro genotoxicity tests? Well, the first reason is our low specificity, which results in a high number of misleading positives. And misleading positives are chemicals that show a positive result in one or more of the in vitro assays, but finally show a negative result in the in vivo assays. So these misleading positives trigger unnecessary animal assays, which are timely, uh, time consuming, costly, and not always biologically relevant to humans. A second reason why we need to improve the current genotoxicity battery of tests is a lack of integration of new approach methodologies. And one interesting domain of new approach methodologies are essays based on the evaluation of changes in gene expression profiles after exposure to a chemical of interest. Different techniques such as RTQPCR, microarray, and RNA sequencing are able to identify gene expression profiles. By combining gene expression profiles with machine learning algorithms, new predictive models for genotoxicity could be developed. We also developed a transcriptomics-based biomarker for genotoxicity in human HEPRG cells. This biomarker consists of a set of 84 genes, which were previously derived from microarray experiments. And therefore, we have selected 24 reference chemicals, 12 known in vivo genotoxic chemicals and 12 known in vivo non-genotoxic chemicals. Human HEPRG cells were exposed to their low cytotoxic con concentration, the IC10, during 72 hours. Later on, microarrays were performed and the transcriptomic data learned us that the genotoxic chemicals left a genotoxic fingerprint on the genetic material, which could be used for future predictions. Afterwards, the microarray experiments were translated into an easy to handle qPCR array. Therefore, the high amount of probe sets that was obtained by the microarrays were subjected to three different statistical approaches to finally obtain the 84 genotoxic specific genes. This genomark assay is able to identify genotoxic chemicals based on the evaluation of changes in the gene expression profiles in the human HEPRG cells. At the moment, we use this tool only for hazard identification since we test at one concentration the IC10. In this research, we wanted to develop a new prediction model based on machine learning. And machine learning is a recent field that has its application in predictive toxicology. Therefore, we wanted to compare unsupervised machine learning algorithms with supervised machine learning to develop the model. When we applied a principal component analysis on the gene expression data of the reference chemicals, we saw the PCE plot in this slide. Here we see two different groups. The red dots are corresponding for the genotoxic chemicals and the green dots are corresponding to the non-genotoxic chemicals. However, in the middle, we see an overlap between both groups indicating that unsupervised machine learning was not sufficient to clearly distinguish both groups and that we needed to move to more complex models such as supervised machine learning to develop a new prediction model, which we finally applied on the misleading positive gene expression data. As a first step, we created an extended data of gene expression data by including the data that was generated by microarray experiments for the 24 reference chemicals as published in the publication by Tatiana Doktorova. Then we also included the data that was generated by qPCR for nine chemicals as published in the publication by Gamze Athis. Then we generated new gene expression data by qPCR for five chemicals 
two known in vivo genotoxic chemicals and three in vivo non-genotoxic chemicals to finally obtain an extended data set of 38 chemicals as a reference data set equally balanced in 19 genotoxic and 19 non-genotoxic chemicals. We selected two different supervised machine learning algorithms to develop the new prediction models. The first one was support vector machine. The support vector machine is based on the building of a hyperplane between, in this case, two groups, genotoxic and non-genotoxic chemicals. And the second machine learning algorithm was random forest. Random forest is based on the building of different decision trees, each having its own prediction outcome. And at the end, the majority vote of predictions is taken for a final prediction. To develop the model, we divided the data sets into 80% training data and 20% test data. For the random forest model, we added an additional step by dividing the training data into 70% training data and 30% validation data. The training data was used to train and learn the model, and the test data was used to evaluate the final prediction performance. When comparing the prediction performance of both models, we first concluded this, that both models showed the same high predictive accuracy of 92.3%. However, the random forest model showed a higher sensitivity compared with the support vector machine model on the test set. We also investigated the impact of outlier genes on the prediction models. Therefore, we've selected four chemicals, two known in vivo genotoxic chemicals, indicated in red, and two known in vivo non-genotoxic chemicals, indicated in green. We created manually outlier gene values by changing the gene expression into low, mid, and high expression. In the picture on the slide, we see the predictions made for the four chemicals having an outlier gene example here, the CCDC178 gene. We, have, we see the predictions made by the support vector machine model on the y-axis, and the predictions made by the random forest model on the x-axis. In the left bottom quadrant, we see that a part of the non-genotoxic chemicals were correctly classified as non-genotoxic by both models. In the upper right quadrant, we see that the two chemicals, the two positive chemicals, were clearly classified as genotoxic by both models. However, in the left upper quadrant, we see that for a part of the non-genotoxic chemicals, only the support vector machine classifies them wrongly as genotoxic. And I'll show you another example of an outlier gene, the FOLH1 gene. We see that all chemicals were classified in the correct class. However, showing you examples of other outlier genes, here we see recurrently that the support vector machine model uh, in, uh, classifies a part of the chemicals in the wrong class. So here we can conclude that the random forest model is more abused having an outlier gene in one of the 84 biomarker genes. We also applied both prediction models on the gene expression data of 10 misleading positive chemicals. As I've already mentioned before, those 10 misleading, uh, misleading positives are chemicals that show a positive result in one or more of the in vitro assay, but finally showed a negative result in the in vivo assay. Those misleading positives were selected based on the recommended database or list of genotoxic and non-genotoxic chemicals by David Kirkland, also the AIMS positive database and other expert opinions. As a first step, we determined the low cytotoxic concentration, the IC10 by a cell viability assay. And afterwards, we obtained the gene expression data by qPCRs. In the table on the slide, we see the prediction scores of both prediction models on the gene expression data for the 10 misleading positives. On the left, we see the prediction scores made by the random forest model. On the right, we see the predictions made by the support vector machine model. When having a prediction or probability prediction lower than 0.45, we classify the chemical as non-genotoxic. When having a probability score higher than 0.56, we classify the chemical as genotoxic. And here we see that six out of the 10 misleading positives were clearly classified as non-genotoxic by both prediction models. One chemical was clearly classified as genotoxic by both models, glutaraldehyde. And when we had a look into the mechanisms of action, 
We have a possible explanation for the positive result by both prediction models. Glutaraldehyde is a cross-linking agent, and additional information in the literature suggests that its negative result in the in vivo assay can be explained by its rapid metabolism and protein binding characteristics, which we cannot mimic in this model. Three out of the 10 misleading positives were clearly def um, classified differently by both models. One chemical, one naphthol, was clearly classified as genotoxic by only the random forest model. And a possible explanation for this classification can also be explained by its mechanism of action. One naphthol could react with glutathione and after SIP metabolization can be formed into naphthokinones, which may cause oxidative stress, which can result in DNA damage. These results suggest that both models are complementary. We also applied both prediction models on the gene expression data of an open data set that was generated by RNA sequencing. In this publication, human HEPAR G cells were exposed during 55 hours to increasing concentrations. They selected 10 chemicals in the test set, six genotoxic, including one anogen colchicine, and also four non-genotoxic chemicals. As I already mentioned, here the gene expression data was obtained by RNA sequencing. We applied our genome mark prediction models on this gene expression data, and we found an overlap of 76 out of the 84 biomarker genes. The predictive accuracy for both models was identically high of 90%. These results demonstrate that GenoMark is also applicable on data generated with other gene expression techniques, such as RNA sequencing. In the table on this slide, I give a summary of the prediction results made by both prediction models on the 10 chemicals of the open data set. Here we concluded that two chemicals were classified differently by both prediction models, cisplatine and colchicine. When we have a look into the individual probability predictions of cisplatine by the random forest model, we saw a concentration dependent increase in the predicted probability for genotoxicity. This suggests that when cisplatine might have tested in a higher concentration, the random forest model could also have picked it up as genotoxic. Other explanations for a different result in both classifiers can also be explained by its shorter exposure time. In the publication, chemicals were exposed during, during 55 hours, while in the genomark assay, chemicals are exposed during 72 hours. Another reason could also be due to the overlap of 76 out of the 84 genes. In this table, we compare both prediction models. And based on the comparison of the specificity, the sensitivity, and the impact of outliers, we have a small preference for the random forest model. However, having the same predictive accuracy of 92.2%, and also that we dem demonstrated that both models are applicable on gene expression data generated by other gene expression techniques, we, su we suggest to use both models complementary and also in a weight of evidence approach. For example, when having a chemical of interest and applying both prediction models on the gene expression data, a positive call for genotoxicity by both models results in an overall positive result, suggesting that the chemical would be classified as genotoxic. Having a negative call for genotoxicity by both models results in an overall negative result, suggesting that the chemical would be classified as non-genotoxic. Having a different call for genotoxicity in both models results that further investigation is needed. And here we mean by actually considering the genomark data with other existing in vitro data or with other new approach methodologies that are essential for the assessment of a genotoxic potential of a chemical. These results demonstrate that indeed the combination of machine learning algorithms with gene expression profiles is an interesting domain for genotoxicity assessment. To facilitate data analysis and also to rapidly evaluate the genotoxic potential of a chemical of interest without requirement of knowledge of coding or software programming, we made GenoMark available as an online application combining both prediction models. This 
online application is freely accessible by the link that we also shared on this slide. Researchers can actually import their gene expression data or they can download an example input file as a tutorial. When the gene expression data is analyzed, both prediction models are run behind the scenes in a weight of evidence approach. And as an output, you get the individual probability predictions made by each model and also the overall prediction in the weight of evidence approach. This table is easily to download as a final outcome. So as a conclusion, we can say that Genomark is able to identify genotoxic chemicals based on the evaluation of changes in gene expression levels in human HEPRG cells. The both support vector machine and the random forest based prediction models allow to classify compounds according to their genotoxicity. We demonstrated a good prediction accuracy for misleading positives. And as a context of use, we propose to use Genomark as a first screening assay to have already an indication of a possible um, indication of uh, genotoxic potential or to use it in combination with other new approach methodologies in a weight of evidence approach. So we demonstrated that Genomark is an interesting new approach methodology to assess uh, the genotoxicity of a chemical of interest. What will we, what's going on for our next uh, research? So we also want to investigate um, and hire throughput technology. We want to, to test the tempo, sequ uh, tempo sequencing uh, instead of the, the qPCR. We also want to investigate the quantitative uh, use of the Genomark data by using the benchmark dose approach. And actually, at the moment, we have already very interesting preliminary data for two chemicals of interest, demonstrating that we can use the benchmark dose approach for potency ranking. We also want to investigate the complementarity between Genomark and other transcriptomics-based biomarkers, for example, the, the TGXCDI biomarker. And also as a follow-up of, uh, of this research, we also want to investigate the possible role of Genomark in an integrated approach to testing and assessment for genotoxicity with other new approach methodologies. And for further validation, um, we can say that recently we also submitted our pre-submission document to Earl ECFAM for the validation of Genomark as a new approach methodology. And with this slide, I want to thank you for listening and also especially thank my promoters of the VUB, Professor Van Haken and Professor Regiers, as well my promoter of Sien Sano, Birgit Mertens, for helping me to obtain these results and share the results today with all of you. Thank you for listening. I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Anouk. That was a really nice, um, quick overview of your really nice work. Um, do we have any questions? I don't see any yet. So please put your question in the Q&A box. Um, while we're waiting, uh, you started to address it a little bit with your last slide. I was wondering if um, you, know, you were planning to propose you know, a sort of a test guideline or a defined approach to help define how people could use this in a regulatory submission. Um, in the meantime, um, I'm wondering, is there a way for companies or do you know of any companies who have used the online tool for a submission? Because um, if, if there's a, a QSAR, reporting format document available, they could uh, possibly uh, use that to support a submission to reach, for example. Um, so at the moment, I have not yet an idea of industry or researchers who already tried our uh, application because actually it's very recent, it's very new. That's okay. actually also why I wanted to share it with you. Um, but so we would be very happy when people are starting to use it. Um, but also they can contact us if they want to have more information. Uh, but it would be very useful when people will start also uh, the genome biomarker. And because all those biomarkers, they can give so much information together. So 
that's actually that we really want that people start to use this yeah uh, we just all of a sudden have three questions come in okay um all right do you have any plans to extend the number of test chemicals used to further validate the assay or i think maybe the approach is a better word and potentially include cytotoxicants that are known to cause cause false positives okay uh, it's a very interesting question as well because as a first step, of course, the bigger the test set, um, the, the better you can actually define the predictive accuracy and to validate this model. Um, for the moment, we also look into databases that are already existing to not, yeah, to actually apply also this biomarker on existing gene expression data to also have more data on, on existing uh, gene expression data. And since it is a PhD, I am actually in the first phase of, of doing some test chemicals. And we, we, as a next step, the more crucial step right now is also investigating the quantitative uh, use of the gene expression data. So we are including new test chemicals, of course, also for hazard identification, but we also wanted to move right now to more the, the quantitative approach. But to really validate, indeed, we, we are testing or applying this biomarker on, uh, on existing gene expression data. That's also what I, what I showed in the presentation. And uh, I'm thinking the second question was related to misleading positives. Sorry. Uh, they were wondering whether you were including cytotoxicants that are known to cause false positives. So cytotoxicants, actually the first step that we do is first determine a low cytotoxic concentration to distinguish already between the genotoxic effect and the cytotoxic effect. Okay. But right now we are setting up experiments going higher than the IC10 to also see with a maximum of IC50 uh, to actually to, to see how a genome could also classify those chemicals in a higher cytotoxic concentration. Um, but we, we, we really want to look into the genotoxic effect, so not the cytotoxic effect. So that's why we do the cell viability assays. Okay. Maybe one more um, question to, uh, to address. And actually two people have asked sort of similar questions, so I'll try to combine them. Um, they're wondering about selecting HEPA RG cells. So what was the rationale? And did you consider other models? In particular, one of the questions is about the extent of HEPA-RG cell-based gene expression data reliability. Okay, so the rationale between this for the selection of HEPA-RG cells. So as I also mentioned, or you mentioned in the beginning, we want to go to a next generation risk assessment with our animals. So we wanted to have a human relevant model. So therefore we wanted to select human um, based cells and HEPA-RG cells are actually very good since they also have the metabolic competence. They show P53 capacity uh, and they're also very, very similar to all the functions of primary hepatocytes. So that's actually why HEPA-RG cells show a very, very good uh, relevance for, for a human-like model. For example, TP6 cells are also human, but they still need an exogenous uh, metabolic fraction like S9 fraction or HEP G2 cells are also um, human cells, but they show not this, the, the P450 uh, capacity as HEPAR G cells do. So for us at the moment, when we selected it, it was the most relevant model for, for human relevant uh, model for genotoxicity. Okay, great. Um, there's a couple more nice questions in the chat, and I'm gonna see if you can possibly answer them um, during the dur yeah during the next presentation. Okay. Um, sorry, it's in the Q and A, not in the chat. Just to be clear. Um, all right, so we're gonna turn the floor now over to our next presenter, Dr. Silvia Scaglioni. The floor is yours. Thanks, Christine. Thanks for the presentation and uh, yeah, 
It's a pleasure to, to present uh, what we are doing uh, in the last uh, years uh, in terms of uh, the development of the novel 3D clinical physiological system for 3D cancer tissue culture towards the best understanding of the human cancer progression. Um, we aim to, to solve uh, one of the last standing problems of the medical research, that is uh, uh, the possibility to have uh, a reliable uh, um, in vitro model of the human uh, biology. This allowed to overpass the limits of the current uh, models, either in vitro or animal models. Uh, and this is especially important since uh, they are uh, um, poor in predicting the proper uh, outcome and um, leading to a wrong selection of the drugs during the preclinical phase or, or leading to a pure human disease knowledge. Uh, we have developed this uh, um, organ on chip platform named NIVO, multi in vitro organ, that has also uh, received um, the award as best health technology in the last summer from the European Commission. Basically, this uh, uh, NIVO platform allows to culture different types of cellular models uh, in vitro within the chamber as you can see in the slide. Uh, therefore, uh, scientists may keep uh, their already established uh, cellular met methods uh, and they can uh, culture these cells uh, under a physiological fluid flow condition that better uh, recapitulate uh, um, the human uh, biology. In particular, MIVO chamber allows to culture uh, biomimetic membrane, uh, monolayer of cells, uh, organoids, spheroids, and 3D, um, 3D reconstructed tissues, uh, and also biopsies and patient-derived biopsies. We have the, um, worked uh, with different types of cells in the last years, and in particular in cancer um, tissue engineering field, we have worked with uh, breast cancer cells, uh, uh, ovarian um, cells, uh, neuroblastoma, pediatric cells, uh, and uh, in, in all these cases, um, we wanted to um, generate a 3D matrix-based culture, since uh, we do believe the importance to maintain the three-dimensionality of the um, tissue environment in order to keep uh, also the heterogeneity of the tumor uh, model. Therefore, we have developed an alginate-based hydrogen model where the cells can uh, stay alive for longer time, grow, proliferate, create clusters, and also um, uh, organize themselves, uh, themselves uh, like uh, in vivo. Um, then we um, place and culture these uh, 3D tumor models uh, in a fluid dynamic environment by using the MIVO device. Um, of course, uh, the MIVO platform, as I mentioned before, uh, can be also used uh, um, with uh, a 2D monolayer cells, uh, um, like in this picture. So it's not necessary having a 3D culture, although we do believe it's uh, an advantage. Anyway, in this paper, what we demonstrate was the possibility to recapitulate the proper tumor cells migration and infiltration, meaning that we were able to observe uh, the capacity of tumor cells to leave their, um, their condition at the beginning and to enter into the fluid flow condition where they um, received the shear stress induced fluid flow like what happened in the capillary blood flow circulation. This is extremely important because um, in the cancer field, there are many scientists interested in better understanding the rule of the shear stress on the um, circulating tumor cell survival and, and behavior. Moreover, um, in some cases, also, um, pharmacologists are interested in using this type of approach, methodological approach, for um, testing the efficacy of novel therapies um, whose goal is not to reduce the primary tumor growth, but to reduce the infiltration of the tumor cells, and in particular, um, the capacity to reduce the percentage of the tumor cells that uh, enter into the bloodstream. 
Um, in another um, work together with the CRO, we demonstrated that it's possible to use this approach for drug efficacy assays, drastically reducing the timing of the assay um, if compared to the traditional animal xenograft model. What we did is to use the same drug, it was cisplatin, the same cell line, it was an ovarian cell line. Um, we selected this type of tumor because for that tumor, we also know the clinical data, not, not only the animal preclinical data. And we measure the cell viability in animal model, in, in a 3D tumor model cultured within our organ on chip platform and in the standard um, culture in vitro, meaning uh, the static uh, condition. What we obtained, it was a, a reduction or uh, regression actually of the tumor mass, uh, both in mice and in our MIVO platform, um, while the static in vitro culture displayed a chemo resistance that was not in line with the clinical data. We better investigated this um, result from a scientific point of view, and we observed that uh, the, um, the issue of the static uh, culture was uh, the poor and unpredictable diffusion of the drug. In fact, when uh, the culture of the tumor cells is a 3D culture, it happens that the drug is able to kill the, the external uh, um, cells, here placed and uh, stained in red, while in the inner part of the matrix of the tumor, you observed many proliferating tumor cells. While in the dynamic condition, so in the in vitro condition that uh, proper resemble the diffusion of the drug um, due to the uh, fluid flow condition, very few proliferating cells were observed, while the dead cells were homogeneously dispersed in a 3D matrix, as what happened in mice model. Therefore, we, we, we concluded that this alternative novel approach allowed to obtain highly predictive results in line with the preclinical animal and clinical data, so also following a cruelty-free treatment approach. We moved on um, thanks to these uh, promising results uh, and we decided to um, characterize uh, from a phenotypic point of view uh, the tumor cells. In this case, uh, we used another tumor model. It was a pediatric tumor model thanks to two important partnerships we have with the two most important pediatric hospitals in, in Italy, the Gaslini Hospital in Genoa and the Bambin Gesù Hospital in Rome. Therefore, the immunologist requested to observe the proper up and down regulation of the receptor membrane of these tumor models, because these are the target of the immunotherapies. We therefore culture in a, in a similar um, 3D alginate matrix uh, um, displayed before, uh, this uh, um, neuropediatric uh, cell line, two different uh, cell line, more aggressive and less aggressive. And in both cases, uh, we stain um, the most important receptor membrane that are the PVR, B7H3, PDL1, and PDL2. PDL1 and PDL2 are also um, the most uh, um, used target of the um, current uh, um, immunological agents uh, developed by the pharma companies. And most importantly, we observe the proper down regulation of the PDR and up regulation of the other three receptors when we introduce interferon gamma in the culture that is typically released by the immune cells. This was extremely important because uh, scientists, immunologists uh, already knew um, these um, results by the clinical data, but in some cases like for the PDL2 and B7H3 was never observed before using the standard um, 2D monolayer of cells. We then moved on and we cultured the uh, neuroblastoma tumor model within the MIVO device and we placed in circulation immunocells. So 
while before in, in the previous paper we placed in circulation the cisplatin for assembling the systemic drug administration, here we placed in circulation immune cells under the proper um, capillary blood flow condition. Therefore, the immune cells um, were affected by uh, the gravity forces, uh, the fluid flow, and uh, um, in some cases uh, by the um, by the force, uh, um, by, by the chemical force uh, um, received by the tumor cells cultured within the tumor, um, the tumor model. Uh, we then analyzed at different time points the capacity of the immune cells to, uh, let's say, extravasate, meaning leave the fluid flow circulation and pass through the porous permeable barrier, mimicking the blood, um, the blood um, flow barrier, and the extravasate and the um, infiltrate the tumor niche. And intensively, we observed a tumor-specific immune cell extravasation, meaning that when in the matrix, we had just the matrix, but not uh, the tumor cells, the percentage of the immune cells extravasated was significantly lower than the case with tumor cells. This was extremely important because it was possible to uh, properly resemble what happened in vivo through a um, standardized and automated approach. Moreover, we observed some immune cells infiltrated within the matrix. So here you can see the matrix. Uh, this is the 3D tumor matrix. You can see uh, the tumor cells, but also some immune cells highlighted by the red arrows uh, that were able to infiltrate within the matrix and start to interact with the tumor cells. So here the tumor cells are staining in red, while um, the immune cells are staining in green. So immune cells were able not only to leave the capillary blood flow and enter into the tumor niche, but also to enter into the matrix and also to start the interaction with the tumor cells. In fact, we also analyzed and observed an initial apoptosis induction by the immune cells, which is, which is correlated to the amount of the immune cells seeded. This was extremely important because it opens the possibility to um, uh, to use this approach for testing the novel uh, immunomodulating agents uh, and also to better understanding the cross-talk between uh, immuno and tumor cells. Moreover, uh, <coughs> since the MIVO device allows uh, to um, fluidic, uh, fluidically connect different chambers, meaning different organs, you can consider the possibility to, um, to culture to co-culture different organs like the gut and the liver for pharmacokinetics purposes, but also um, different organs like uh, the tumor and the liver for pharmacodynamics assays. In fact, um, while uh, in, in, a, in an European proje project, uh, we are uh, co-culturing the primary tumor model with the tissue target of the metastasis to complete the overall journey of the, of the tumor cells in vitro. Um, we are now um, working to um, carry out a simultaneous uh, safety and efficacy assays within the same experiment. This is possible because you can consider, for instance, the possibility to culture the tumor tissue in one chamber of the MIVO and the liver in another chamber. We analyze using different doses of the drugs, the capacity of the drug to reduce the tumor, meaning the efficacy, and also the uh, negative uh, effect, meaning the toxicity, against the target the tissue, such as the liver, in case of the hepatotoxicity. Uh, for this purpose, we uh, combine it with the um, 3D tumor model already presented um, a, a, a culture of the FG2 um, liver cells in a monolayer 
we worked with different uh, um, doses of the cheese platin, and uh, it was really important to um, carry out this uh, um, toxo efficacy assays using both a single organ model, meaning just the tumor model here, either 2D or 3D, and the liver model here at different doses, observing the, the, um, uh, the dead cells through the dead live staining kit in the tumor model, and uh, um, the, the, the presence of the dead cells for the liver. Moreover, we analyzed um, the difference between um, the culture in 2D and in 3D using the SCOV3, so the ovarian tumor model in study condition. And we um, observed a different uh, response, a different doses of the cheese platin if the cells are cultured in 2D or in 3D. This uh, makes sense because uh, as um, I said before, in study condition, the presence of a matrix may limit the diffusion of the drug. This is the reason of why typical 2D monolayer cell culture may overexpress the effect of the drug. We then uh, moved on and we decided to leave the uh, single organ configuration and to um, work with a multi-organ configuration where you can see the liver in one chamber and the tumor in another chamber. It was also um, important to, it's important also to say that uh, um, this platform allowed to uh, work with different uh, um, media and different growth factors. So in case your cells um, appreciate and work better with different uh, um, culture media or co uh, cocktail of growth factors, um, the gradient of the, of the different uh, culture media is maintained for days, meaning that uh, the, the, the chambers are fluidically connected. They start with two different uh, um, niches in terms of uh, biochemical stimuli. And over the, over the time, you, you can um, evaluate a, a mixing of this, um, of this media and of course a mixing of the, of the drug, still keeping the differentiation of the two different cell culture. Um, it was important to, to see here that the multi-organ configuration displayed an increased effect um, of, the, of the drug, suggesting also, sorry, an increasing uh, EC50, uh, suggesting a cooperative effect, meaning that when you have two different uh, um, tissue models, uh, the response is different if compared to the single, uh, to the single organ, and this makes sense. Uh, as what happened uh, in vivo. Um, this was, happen was uh, possible because uh, the uh, MIVO chamber configuration displayed a three-way three valve that allows uh, to sample in the media different time points without uh, perturbing the, the tissue culture. And therefore it's possible to carry out molecular uh, biochemical assays during uh, the culture. Of course, you will have, uh, um, in case uh, you, you like, uh, the possibility to see and to handle uh, the MIVA technology also at the HESTIV training course uh, next, uh, next month. And uh, the hands-on training is always uh, a useful uh, um, opportunity uh, for the scientists to, to handle and play with novel technology. Uh, so in conclusion, I can... Um, summarize the advantages of this platform, that is uh, the presence of the physiological fluid flow condition that allow to make a more predictive uh, um, drug test, the possibility to, to culture um, also three-dimensional clinically relevant site tissues uh, without losing uh, the real complexity of the human tissue. And this is especially important uh, for those that are interested in to culture patient-derived cells because it opens the possibility towards uh, the development of personalized therapies. The organ-organ connections allows us to better understanding the cross-talk between different organs and finally obtaining uh, 
um, safer drugs because they are properly selected. At the moment, uh, um, the more high throughput configuration the systems allow to culture up to eight uh, independent experiments in parallel. And uh, um, lastly, but not least, uh, I wanted to thank ESTIV for, the, for this opportunity. And I remind you the possibility of the ESTIV uh, training uh, course next month. I want to thank the European Commission for, uh, in particular, the grant supporting part of this research and uh, my team in uh, Red for Life at the CNR and the University of Geneva. Thanks. Uh, great, thank you, Sylvia, for that preview of your of your platform. Looks very interesting results. Um, please enter your questions in the Q and A, and I will ask them. Oh, look, we have one. Great. Yes, there is a first question about the possibility to apply uh, natural killer cells as immune cells uh, in co-culture or, or other uh, type of cells. In our laboratory, we have worked with just uh, natural killer cells, but as I mentioned, we have uh, um, many collaborators uh, and partnership with other uh, um, uh, immunologist centers, uh, and they are currently working also with other type of immune cells. So this is possible, of course. I was also wondering um, when you were showing your um, data about the, the co-culturing with hepatic cells, is it possible, I know you were looking mostly at toxicity to the hepatic cells, is it possible that they also metabolically transform the treatment and or could yeah. you do that if you, if that's what you wanted to to investigate specifically? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, it, it, I may answer to your question together with the question in the chat about the, the customizable uh, approach of the flow rate, because uh, um, what I missed to say that is that the, the Vivo platform is really flexible. So you can uh, customize, for instance, the flow rate because you can uh, uh, changing the, the setup of the pumping system uh, um, according to, to the need of the scientists and also in terms of the uh, drug administration, you can uh, handle it uh, very in a flexible way. So you can, uh, um, in, for instance, inject uh, different drugs at different time, time points. You can uh, um, in, inject, let's say, the drug in the flow mimicking the systemic administration. But in some other cases, we place the drug on top of the intestinal tissue for assembling the oral administration. So you can manage different type of uh, configuration, right? Uh, another question, wondering if you have looked at respiratory cell models um, with immune cells together. Yes, uh, yes, we had an experience, uh, let's say, with the respiratory cell models because we have won um, a national project about the COVID. So we work with both uh, um, respiratory cell models and also with cardiac uh, cells uh, together with the COVID virus uh, directly or uh, with the um, cytokine storm produced by the COVID. And therefore, uh, also in this case, yes, the answer is that you can use different type of uh, epithelial or models or such as the respiratory models. And in that case, especially for the respiratory cellular model, what I can say that typically um, end users appreciate the possibility to use the different flow lines below um, the respiratory cellular models for assembling the blood flow and also above for mimicking the eye flow um, condition above the respiratory model. Uh, and also the air liquid interface can be managed in case. I'm just curious about the users of your um, technology. Typically, do you find that they um, are, are, are at companies looking to assess treatments or more um, basic medical researchers at universities looking to use them for research questions? Uh, both. Uh, the difference is that uh, uh, scientists coming from uh, academia and research centers uh, 
are, let's say, more uh, intrinsically innovators. So they um, immediately understand the value and they are able to immediately draw their experiments in their mind. And therefore, they adapt the technology and thanks to its flexibility to their need. Vice versa, uh, pharma companies are, and um, um, testing companies, they prefer to have a, um, a joint path in order to draw together uh, the optimal uh, um, experimental condition for these for their uh, uh, application. Okay. Uh, there is a question about the specificity of the model, but I'm not sure Maybe. exactly what they're referring to. <laughs> Maybe the question is, is because uh, some uh, organ on chip have already embedded some cells uh, and therefore they are specific for specific applications. So yeah. um, the organ on chip for gut, the organ on chip for liver, uh, our approach was different. So we prefer to um, validate the, the model in different uh, verticals, provide uh, scientific papers and protocols, but the the, the platform itself is not specific. Okay. Okay. Well, that is the end of the questions that I see. We do have a lot of comments, both in the Q&A and in the chat, thanking you for your talk. Um, very interesting talk. I will extend those comments to Anouk as well. Um, thank you both for coming on to present your work. And uh, thank you all on the line for joining us today. We'll put the recording up on the website in a couple of days. And um, I hope you all have a great week. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, bye.